Hello, cruel world. I am your host for a Psych for Sore Minds. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist and I live and work in London. I assess mentally disordered offenders so you don't have to. So this is part three of a three-part series about gangs and offenders. So I've talked about patients that I've personally assessed because I think that's my USP. The last two episodes I told you about a real life case of a group of teenagers murdering a teenager. And also I told you about a young man who was the target of a local gang who became mentally unwell, developed post-traumatic stress disorder. This episode, I'm gonna tell you about another case where I'm pretty sure that a gang exploited a vulnerable man and got him to do their dirty work for him. And he ended up in prison on a very serious weapons related charge. But first, I'm gonna tell you something interesting about gang membership and how it can increase the level of security required within forensic psychiatric hospitals. So within our hospitals, we have secure units for the highest risk patients. So they have like industrial strength locked doors. There are metal fences around the staff trained in control and restraints and they carry like these security alarms to press when things get hairy. So there are different levels of security. There's low secure, medium secure, and high secure, Broadmoor being the most notorious high secure hospital. So if a patient has strong gang affiliations and there's a concern, their gang might try and break them out of hospital, this can actually change their risk profile. And it could be a reason for them to like move up the ladder of security. So for example, if somebody had a relatively minor assault or a misdemeanor, they might be clinically suitable for low secure, but they might end up in medium security because of the security risk. Or somebody could have committed a fairly serious offense like grievous bodily harm, and they might be suitable for medium secure, but they might actually be moved up to a high secure unit. I've only known this to happen maybe twice in my career, so it's very rare, but it does happen. Just wanna tell you a quick story. When I worked as a junior psychiatrist in Australia near Sydney in 2007, there was a gang related incident in one of these hospitals. It was actually during the weekend, so I wasn't working personally and it wasn't my patient, but I heard all about it. Basically, there was a young man from a Lebanese notorious street gang and he became detained in one of these hospitals because he was psychotic. And this particular hospital was way out in the sticks. And although it was locked, it didn't have those levels of security. And five gang members forced their way into the hospital. They threatened loads of people. They punched a couple of the nursing staff and they actually rescued their friends and took him out of the building. Reminding me a bit of Murdoch from the 80s. The police were obviously called and there was a big standoff and the man was eventually re-detained and a couple of his gang members were actually arrested. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about my YouTube channel next. Welcome to a Psych for Sore Minds. I'm your host, Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist and I assess and rehabilitate mentally disordered offenders or what the tabloids might call criminal insane. I work in prisons and in courts and in secure units and I also work as an expert witness so I give advice to judges in criminal courts all across the UK. This channel, a Psych for Sore Minds, dissects a whole range of mental health topics some of which are related to offending and violence and some which are completely not. There's new episodes out every Tuesday and most Fridays. Please look out for them. There's something for everybody on this channel. So next, I'd like to tell you about the case of Mr. J. So Mr. J was a 21 year old man when I assessed him and he was part of a gang. However, I believe that the gang actually took advantage of him. As always, I've anonymized this case. I've changed some of the demographic details out of respect of patient confidentiality and also out of respect for the victims and their families. Although I would really like to emphasize that the essence of these cases is 100% real. Same as most of my patients that I see in forensic psychiatry, Mr. J had a harsh upbringing. I think this is especially common in people that are involved in gangs. And I think this is highlighted in the three cases that I've talked about across this series. And that's because things like harsh upbringing, poor parenting, violence, abuse, poverty, drug use, either with the patient themselves or with their parents or family, all of these things predispose a person to offending and to mental illness. So we see them a lot in forensic psychiatry, but they also predispose people 
to move towards gangs. So I see it's even, it's another factor that's even more relevant to the people that we see in gangs. And that's why it's so common. And case in point, let's look at Mr. J's background. So Mr. J's mother was only 15 when she had him and she was also a sex worker. Mr. J was in and out of uh, care in his younger years. So I assess Mr. J at the Old Bailey, which is for our foreign friends, it's a massive, really renowned central criminal court in London. And Mr. J was up for quite a serious firearms charge. He was carrying a rucksack down the road when the police drove past him and he saw them, he panicked and he bolted. Obviously he looked suspicious, so the police chased him and they recovered the rucksack. He, he had dumped it into a garden at this point, I should say. So the police looked through the rucksack and they found like this massive sawn off shotgun and some shotgun cartridges as well. So they arrested him. The police believed that Mr. J was like a courier. He was carrying weapons for more established gang members who were about to have a massive big gang war for a retaliation for another gang member that had got beaten up recently. In terms of his forensic history, Mr. J had lots of petty kind of crimes mostly in the form of like shoplifting. This has happened over the years. But around the same times he joined a gang, which was 18 months before I assessed him, his offending escalated. So when I assessed him, he told me that 18 months ago, he was actually homeless and he was in a park and he was approached and befriended by a gang. Mr. J told me that they took him under their wing and they took care of him. And it's quite tragic really. He talked about this gang as if they were a substitute for his family. But it actually sounded to me like they were bullying him and they were taking advantage of him. So he sold drugs on their behalf. And within that fairly short 18 month period, he'd been arrested three separate times and charged with possession of class A drugs. So it, to me, it looked like they were setting him up to take all the risks while they got all the money and all the benefit. And he was even beaten up on one occasion because he was robbed by another drug dealer and that was his punishment for losing the drugs. I actually felt sorry for Mr. J because it was clear to me that the gang were taking advantage of him and he didn't even seem to realize this because when he spoke to me about the gang, he spoke about them sort of fondly. I also thought that he might have a borderline learning disability. So this is a pathologically low IQ, a low intelligence, which significantly reduces the ability to understand new or complex information or to learn new skills and also just to function in general. So Mr. J left school with no qualifications, which is a good indication of a learning disability. Although to be fair, this might have just been his chaotic background and lifestyle at the time as a child, as opposed to an actual diagnosis of a learning disability. So my recommendation to the court was that Mr. J should have a formal IQ test to confirm this diagnosis. But the thing is, even if he did have a learning disability, this probably didn't directly influence his offending and he still knew what he was doing and he knew what he was doing was wrong. So I felt, and I said in my court report, that he had full culpability and full understanding of his actions. And because of that, the court weren't really interested in delaying the case. They didn't agree with my request for an IQ test and they just went through the usual criminal justice route, sent him to prison, and they said that his IQ and his diagnosis could be sorted out in the future after his eventual release. And I have to say, I felt quite sorry for Mr. J because he was looking at a very long sentence and as I said, it seemed to me that he was just doing the gang's bidding, as far as I can tell. And also, as far as I knew, he wasn't actually going to be involved in the ruckus itself. He was merely transporting the weapons. Again, he was taking all the risk. And of course, I acknowledge that this is still very serious and it could have led to very serious violence. There could have been murder and Mr. J would have been implicit, but it still felt like he was being manipulated. I had considered whether Mr. J was lying to me to make himself look less guilty, but I didn't think that was the case because it didn't seem as if he was having an agenda. He wasn't trying to shift the blame. He wasn't trying to make it look as if he'd drawn the short straw and the gang had taken advantage of him. If anything, he was trying to suggest the opposite. I'd like to take a quick break and then I'm gonna tell you about what's coming soon on A Psych for Sword Minds. So I'm really excited to tell you guys about my news, which is that I'm going to be a speaker at CrimeCon UK, which is gonna be in June, 2021 in London. It's a massive convention in the States. It's really established and it's coming to the UK for the first time. There's gonna be lots of expert speakers from law enforcement agents to reporters, to your favorite true crime podcasters and bloggers. And I will be doing a talk about two real life cases that I've assessed of people who have actually killed their own family members. And I'll be looking at their mental health and their criminal culpability. So if you are a true crime enthusiast, if you actually call yourself and consider yourself as one of those, you cannot miss out on this event. Below in the description, there'll be a link to how you can get your tickets 
Because I've got your back, you can get a 10% discount if you use the code PSYCH at the checkout when you buy your tickets. I've not yet figured out what I'm going to do for the next few episodes of the Psych for Sore Minds. I've got lots of ideas in my head. I've got quite a few high profile murder cases that are related to mental illness, which is my area of specialty. As always, I'm open to suggestions, but I've got great news for you. And that is this. If you subscribe to our channel, not only does it help me out immeasurably, but it actually prevents hair loss. I'd be very grateful if you put your comments and thoughts in the section, generate some discussion, ask me some questions. I'm happy to hit you back. I'll give you my true thoughts and opinions on anything you want to ask me. Till then, follow us on Instagram, like our Facebook, follow us on Twitter, submit an episode idea or any questions to our email, which is psychforsoreminds at gmail.com. And if you're going to reference us, use the hashtag psychforsore. Please tell your favorite people about Psych for Sore Minds. We are growing steadily, but I'm very impatient and I want more success. I want it all and I want it quickly. So please tell other people they deserve it. Spread the love. Until next time, stay euthymic and please, please, please do not forget. I love you.